Okay, so we've seen that the dislocation um, is the mechanism for plastic deformation in metals. <clears throat> and I want to use that as a, as a kind of a, a framework for getting into looking at other imperfections in materials. So the imperfection is a special kind. It's a linear imperfection. I'll show you that later. But I want to show you how the dislocation can interact with other Im uh, imperfections. And we can use that as engineers to increase the strength of materials. So that's what I'd like to look at. Uh, and often what we do, one thing we can do, the way in fact that I like to look at imperfections, is I like to organize imperfections according to their dimensionality. That is, what, how many dimensions in space do they occupy? And this is fairly frequently done. So zero dimensional would be things that only occupy one space in the, one point in the lattice. So one point in the lattice in fact, you might call that a point um, defect, okay? Defect. Now, this is actually a worthwhile time for me to mention that defect and imperfection are used synonymously here. I prefer to use the term imperfection because I think it has less of a negative connotation associated with it. Um, a lot of times when you hear the word defect, you think, oh, that's bad, i got to get rid of it. But in fact, as engineers, wanting to control the behavior of material, whether it's optical behavior, electrical, mechanical properties, magnetic, you name it, what do we do? We engineer the population of defects. We control the number of defects, the type, and that's how we get material to behave the way we want it to, um, to improve its behavior. So I don't like to use the word defect um, all the time because I think it has that negative connotation. And I want you to remember that, in fact, there's these imperfections that are designed in intentionally. They're, um, and, and they're often good, if you will, if you want to use sort of uh, that type of terminology. They can be good. In practice, you will find that the word defect is used, especially associated with zero-dimensional imperfections. So point defect is often uh, what is, <coughs> is used. And then uh, what about a one-dimensional imperfection? Well, these are the ones that we saw in the previous video. These are called dislocations. Okay. Now, when you first look at dislocations, it might be a little bit difficult to see why they are, in fact, one-dimensional. But I'll look at uh, we'll, we'll look at those in a little more detail. Uh, two-dimensional. Well, two-dimensional are um, really they, these are interfaces. Okay, so they could be internal interfaces, which are then called grain boundaries or crystal boundaries, and we'll look at that. Um, but they could be the interface with, of the material with with, an, with air. You know, you've got um, some material, like, see my keys here. Okay, this is a metal, and, you know, there's little brass atoms organized in there. Uh, brass atoms, sorry, there's copper and zinc. Um, but there's, they're, they're mixed together, and they're in a particular lattice, though. They are in a, in a specific uh, crystal structure. But then all of a sudden, there's a free surface. There's air, and my finger, or whatever, right? But um, there's a disruption in the regular repeating arrangement. So that is... Uh, free surface. We'll look at those a little bit as well. They're quite important. Free surfaces. And then what about three-dimensional? Well, three-dimensional is essentially like a two-dimensional imperfection wrapped around something else. So these are things that have volume, obviously, um, and some examples of these would be um, pores. Those are usually bad, um, but not necessarily always. Those are little bubbles almost. In the material pores, uh, what about um, second phases. Okay, second phases. Um, those are a few. So what's the second phase? Well, that's a lot to digest perhaps, but we are familiar with different crystal structures and materials can often have different crystal structures um, in the solid phase, in the solid state within them. Um, I mean, here's another example I uh, just happened to see here. Uh, take a look at my, uh, my desk. I've got a, a concrete um, desk here that I made a few years back, and there's these little, um, you know, these are aggregate particles. That's actually slag. It's recycled. It's a, it's like a glass uh, byproduct of some steel making. Um, but the, there's little, um, there's other various second phase particles. Now these are obvious. There's some stones and stuff in there. These are obvious because um, I, mean, I can see them with the naked eye, but they they do contribute to the properties of the concrete and the, how readily water will um, diffuse through the concrete. Not that my desk gets wet that often, but um, in concrete they're important in that regard, uh, how they support stresses, um, in fact, how do they contribute to the cost of concrete. Um, 
so the, the, there's, there's many other examples of the volume of three-dimensional imperfections, not only in concrete materials, of course, but in, in a lot of metallic materials um, as well, and even in some polymeric materials. We can discuss uh, that a little bit as well. But this is a way of organizing uh, imperfections, and what we're going to do is we're going to go through each of those in turn and uh, see how they interact with the dislocation uh, to strengthen the material. And then in some cases also later on in the course, we'll circle back to some of those and see how they influence electrical and optical properties. Okay, thanks a lot.